they have already decided before people have even started voting that they're not going to accept the results this November. If we were going to get people to, to lift up their voices in power, we had to have trusted messengers from local communities to motivate them to get out to vote. Our fate is in our hands. No more waiting for somebody outside to save us. We're going to save ourselves. It's all coming up on The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. What happened in 2020 in Georgia that led to a Democratic majority in the U.S. Senate and the election of President Joe Biden, the first Democrat to win Georgia since 1992? Republican charges of dirty tricks have been investigated repeatedly. They didn't happen. What did happen has been studied far less well. So today, we look at what the authors of a new book are calling The Georgia Way and what it has to teach those who are campaigning for next month's midterms and the 2024 race. The winds of 2020 were miraculous, they write, but also built on years, nay decades of work. To tell us more, I'm happy to introduce Stephen Rosenfeld, the editor and chief correspondent of Voting Booth, a project of the nonprofit Independent Media Institute. Stephen is the co editor with Ray McClendon of the book The Georgia Way How to Win Elections. He also authored a new report on how election systems actually work. Ray McClendon is the NAACP Political Action Committee Chair in Atlanta, Georgia, and an organizer focused on voter turnout. Andrea Miller is an organizer based in Virginia who is the executive director of the Center for Common Ground, People Demanding Action, and the founding president of the National Women's Political Caucus of Virginia. So welcome, everybody. And let me start with you, Ray. Thanks for joining us. Just remind us all what actually happened in Georgia in 2020 and why it was so important. Well, thank you so much for having us today. And in 2020, we had made a, a conscious decision that if we were to make the difference that was required in a most consequential election, the civic engagement groups needed to come together and to coordinate their activities to be much more effective and efficient. Uh, as opposed to being in silos, uh, operating in, on their own devices, uh, we had a conscious plan to come together and bring all of these groups together so that we would be uh, much better organized and much more effective. Uh, this created a statewide organization with the help of many folks like Stephen and of course, Andrea, and many of the other groups that are familiar to you and, and others around the country. And we did this each and every week for several months leading up to the, the November election and indeed for those critical runoffs. And that is what uh, made the difference in a turnout. And especially in the runoff for the two Senate races, we were able to get 95% of the Black voters who had voted in the November election returned to the polls on January the 5th, an unprecedented historic uh, turnout for a runoff election. And Andrea, as people may have noticed, we made the point that you were actually based in Virginia and you work in Virginia. Why was your experience in Virginia important and how did it feed into this story? I'm a digital strategist, so I have digital voter files for not only Virginia, but Virginia and also Georgia. So we took the experience that we had had in Virginia, utilizing texting and phone banking on a statewide basis and brought that infrastructure or provided the underpinnings of that infrastructure in Georgia. During the runoff, we also introduced a new system to Georgia, one that we had used in Virginia that gave us a lot more and better phone numbers for connecting with 
voters. It also didn't hurt that our volunteers wrote 1.5 million postcards to voters in Georgia either. Stephen, coming to you, why did you think it was so important to capture this story of what happened in Georgia, the Georgia way, in, in the way that you have? Most political histories are written as nonfiction narratives, and it's, it's almost like you're always racing from the starting line to the finish line, and it really overlooks the interpersonal aspects of campaigning. In 2020, during the pandemic, people really had to make a special effort to innovate, reach out, use new technology, and help each other attend a Sunday church service over Zoom. Well, that became an organizing tool to actually do other kinds of organizing. Is your voter registration up to date? Do you have a plan to get a ballot? Have you gotten your ballot? Have you returned it? If, if there are any questions, we go go to an early voting site, deal with it there in person. So what the opportunity to do an oral history is so interesting to me because basically you have all of these ordinary people who are committed and some of them are just amazing and many of them are just people who, who value civic engagement. And it was great to hear their voices. There were tons of women. It wasn't just men giving orders. And often it was the young women who were some of the most incredibly energetic organizers. So this was a rare thing. And I had heard afterwards, and I didn't give it that much thought, that uh, it's rarely done. We rarely have oral histories about the people who do actually the work. Ray McClendon, coming to you, one of the things I noticed in this book was that a couple of the contributors whose stories you include make the point that this was not a Democratic Party operation. This was the collaboration of many civic engagement organizations in the Black community across the state of Georgia. Uh, We have, uh, as an example, the Divine Nine, all of the Black uh, Greek fraternities and sororities, uh, the Masons, which is the oldest fraternal organization from the Black community dating all the way back to uh, uh, prior to the Revolutionary War, started by Prince Hall. Uh, the, the NAACP, of course, Black Voters Matter, uh, and groups like Shirley Sharaj Group uh, down in Southwest Georgia. All of these organizations represent the leadership in local communities across the entire 159 counties in Georgia. Those people represent leaders who are trusted messengers. And what we found is when you're doing relational organizing, you want to be able to have leaders talking to people who they already have relationships with that they will trust and rely upon. And that was a a core component of why we put together this group called Team Unity that brought all of those organizations together. And when you say relational organizing, what do you mean and what makes that different? When we go into communities, we wanna go into the communities with people that are already there to have relationships with with the the people that we wanna engage with Uh, to motivate them to get out to vote and understand that we're not just there for a short cycle, political cycle, but that we are interested in what, what it is that will allow them to pursue their best life, that will address their pain points, and that will be there in that community uh, fighting for a better life for them year round. That is much better. Uh, We go into barbershops, into beauty salons and other areas. And when when you go in and you're 30 days out from election, uh, you go into a barbershop and the the young brothers want to know, well, yeah, we see you here now because you want our vote, but you're not concerned about us back in January and February and March when we're fighting to try to figure out how we make a difference in, in our lives with the daily struggles of life in our communities. Coming to you, Andrea, hasn't it often been the case that data roles, um, voter roles, that information has sometimes been held quite tightly um, by consultant groups and, and lobby organizations and others, including party chapters. What enabled you to do it differently when it comes to data this time around? What we did is we went out and we bought all of our own data. We went to a new vendor, not one that most people think of when they think of the Democratic Party 
and we bought our own data. We bought our own voter files. Most of the organizations that Ray works with generally do not have their own voter files. Voter files are complicated to deal with. And again, um, I'm also a, a digital strategist. So I could do the IT, I could do the organizing, and I also knew about competitive products. So that was what allowed us to put together superior digital infrastructure. And one of the things that's so fantastic about the oral histories that you gathered is the generational span that's represented there. Ray, I mean, you want to talk just again about who was involved and and what stands out to you in terms of that picture of a united movement that we get from studying the Georgia way? Absolutely. Well, well, we've already talked about the different organizations, but within those organizations, there are generations that are at work. And you mentioned uh, Shirley Sherrod as, a, as one of those examples, who's been involved in making a difference in the Black community in Southwest Georgia uh, and, and putting her integrity and responsibility on the line for decades. And the critical thing there is, and what differentiates us from any other organization is that we understood that it was important that if we were gonna get people to, to lift up their voices and power, we had to have trusted messengers from local communities. Stephen uh, alluded to the fact that we were in the middle of a pandemic and everybody was focused on Georgia. And we were getting requests from all over the country that people wanted to fly in and they wanted to canvas and do other things. And we said, hey, that's great. We love that. But what we need to do, we don't need people from California flying in and canvassing in, in South Georgia. It doesn't work that way. What we need for you to do is save, save that money and send us that airfare and help us put people on the ground in the local communities who those people know. And did they do it? They did it. And that was what made the difference. So you take people like a Shirley Sherrod and the people who were working for her and many others like her that are unheralded nationally, but are known in their local communities. They can knock on doors. They can go into their churches and say, hey, I've known you from the time you were born and you better get out and vote. It's those kinds of conversations that can only be had by local people that make the difference and will be respected and responded to. I'm rolling my eyes because as Stephen knows, we used to work together. I wrote a book on exactly this, interviewing people about this exact problem back in 2006. So I am thrilled that perhaps there has been some learning and some change. Andrea, you've got actually examples of other groups learning from Georgia. Ah, uh, yes. Virginia really took a hard look at the Georgia way and 16 counties in Northern Virginia formed something called Nova Partners, where they're all going to work together. They will all be trained. And when they bring their people or as they bring their people on, we do the training. So everybody's getting the same training. We figured out and analyzed when we knock on doors, what doors do we knock on? And it is a team effort. Now, Andrea, you um, have talked a bit about technology and what you did differently. It also should be mentioned that Georgia did have some new systems in place, 16-day early voting, um, automatic registration, no excuses, absentee ballots. You don't have to explain why you need one. Um, to what extent do you attribute what happened there in Georgia to any of those innovations? Uh, well... Georgia's had early voting for a very, very, very long time. So early voting is not new in Georgia. Um, we made sure that not only were people aware that there was early voting, but in our messaging, we told people where it was. If they were in a rural county, we actually gave them the address. 
early voting information is available to the privileged people who have internet. People in rural counties often don't have internet. And the same is true for people who are low income, both rural and urban. So every interaction we have with a voter, we are giving them information. We're not selling candidates or who to vote for. We're making sure, because there were so many changes in 2020, people knew how to vote. Um, Steve, coming to you, while we're talking about technology and voting systems, among other things, I want you to just touch on for a minute what you've written about in your most recent report, which is about the big fears and suspicions um, that many have about some voting systems and the way that those fears have been kind of um, exaggerated or at least, you know, um, emphasized by people trying to undermine the results of elections like Georgia's. In your research, what did you conclude about how worried we should or shouldn't be about the systems per se, meaning the technology, equipment, et cetera? The country right now votes on a new generation of voting machines that mostly have been they've 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 been deployed in the past couple of years, and they're generally focused around using a paper ballot, whether it's marked by hand or marked by a computer. So the the um, the records in the computer systems that can actually go upstream and trace how people voted are more accurate and more detailed than ever. But we're in an environment where um, some people don't want to believe that anything electronic is can be can be trusted. The election officials are in a very defensive posture because they've been attacked since 2020 and they're reluctant to share a lot of that information because what happens is um, the national media doesn't understand the complexity of running an election. You'll read in the New York Times and they'll describe it as a clerical task, which is a bit of a sexist put down. And what, is it, what does it mean to set up an election? It means you have, to con- you have to program and synchronize hundreds and hundreds of digital devices and make sure that everybody gets the right local ballot. And then what's on that ballot is accurately analyzed and then compiled like bricks in a pyramid to subtotals and totals. So what ended up happening in 2020 was, in a handful of places around the country, I mean, I'm talking about like less than half a dozen out of 8,000 jurisdictions, the local officials made mistakes with setups or their contractors did since a lot of this is outsourced. And the election deniers or those who don't want to accept the factual results pounced and said, oh my God, things went wrong. We can't trust the results of this computer here or this, you know, a a small county of 20,000 votes in Michigan we have to throw out the results statewide. We have we can never trust these machines. Were they right? Um, they were wrong. They they were wrong. We're in a very strange moment where there's there's a, a, there are tens of millions of voters who have heard months and months of doubt and fears coming from um, you know, you know right wing media channels. And and a lot of what was done uh, in, in the in the by in these so-called post-election audits, it was political theater. It didn't really instruct anybody on the actual mechanics of how ballots are count, cast and counted. That t- brings us up to where we are today. Where what I think is you know right now already, I'm getting emails and I'm seeing things from some of these same activists. They have already decided before people have even started voting that they're not going to accept the results this November. Clearly there are real needs that people have on the ground to have an election work smoothly, inclusively, accurately, and well. Um, And then there are phantom fears being kind of fueled for ideological reasons. What do you think is most importantly needed right now, Ray? What I think is most importantly needed right now is for people to understand that this election is uh, not about policy, but it's about those who believe in democracy and those who want to see us move to a, to a more authoritarian form of government. Because what, what these uh, people who are kindly called election deniers are doing is essentially uh, 
allowing for the undermining the, of the entire premise of democracy, which is that every vote, valid vote should be counted. What, what we're seeing now is that there's a process which says, heads I win, tails you cheated. And, and that process will, will not allow a democracy to stand. So what we wanna do is have our people recognize that democracy is on the ballot, our freedoms are on the ballot, and therefore we must go out and vote. We also must recognize that we need to stand up and participate in democracy. We are in a participatory democracy, which means that we need volunteers to be poll workers, poll monitors, and to stand up against the authoritarianism, which is trying to take over local election boards so that they, what they tried to do through chicanery and trickery in 2020, they are putting in place right now people who will be able to steal uh, the, the election process legally by having these folks in place. So we've got to step up against that and, 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 and vote our power and participate in the democratic process. There are some people in the book, um, the Georgia way, that say they saw, they glimpsed a new Georgia being born. I think so. And I think we're going to see that story in Virginia where communities that are always overlooked by candidates and both parties find their voice initially talking to each other about what their pain points are and what they really need, and then finding their voice to go and work toward what they need, both from an advocacy side when there is no election, and then an electoral side. So, so many of our communities, they develop palm cards. This is what our community wants. And it doesn't matter that the community next door wants something else. That's great. We've got things in common that we want. We all want portable broadband but we also have unique things. And when we work toward them, that puts us on the pathway to get them. And I think that's what we're seeing in Georgia and in some of the other states like Virginia, where we do have these democracy centers and people are saying, all right, our fate is in our hands. No more waiting for somebody outside to save us. We're going to save ourselves. A great final word. I appreciate all of you for the work you've done and Stephen and Ray for gathering together so many wonderful stories in this ebook that we'll make available through a link at our website. Ray McClendon, Andrea Miller, Stephen Rosenfeld, thank you so much for joining me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Here's a phrase I'd like to get rid of, election denier. You see it popping up in our media coverage as if we were talking about some naturally occurring demographic group like, I don't know, redheads, but we're not. Ideas spread through people. So when you read a New York Times Siena poll like the one released recently that showed that 41% of Republicans and 28% of all the registered voters they polled have little or no faith in the results of the midterm elections coming up, that's no accident. People spread that doubt with intent. Likewise, we sometimes blame technology for the spread of hateful content. But New York Attorney General Letitia James looked recently at the Buffalo Tops Market massacre and called out one individual for having recorded the live stream of the shooter in the course of the massacre and spreading that recording to the web. It didn't happen by virtue of the technology. It happened because a person did it. The AG in New York also calls out the owners of 4chan, who refused to take that video and lots of other similar content down and haven't taken any responsibility for that since. It's no accident, not nature nor the weather. People spread 
hateful ideas and corrosive content, and I'm afraid it's people who are going to have to stop it. What do we do? Well, we keep serving up ideas on our program, and I hope you will continue to join us. You can find all of our election coverage and media criticism in our archives, and don't forget that subscribers to our free podcast receive the full unedited conversation from our program every week. I'm Laura Flanders. Thanks for joining me. Till the next time, stay kind, stay curious. For more on this episode and other forward-thinking content, subscribe to our free newsletter for updates, my commentaries, and our full uncut conversations. We also have a podcast. It's all at lauraflanders.org. Music